Amen. That's what happened to Daniel with the, when he came face to face with that angel of the Lord over there. He touched him and boy, he went to his knees. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray that you'd bless your word tonight and the messenger, Lord, just the messenger. And I pray that you'd anoint the word and give me the wisdom I need, Father, to minister your word tonight, Father. It's your word, Lord, it's not mine. There's power in this word. There's power in the Holy Spirit as he applies it. And I pray that you do that. And whatever's done in this house tonight will be done for your glory, not mine, yours. I want people to have a distinct impression they've heard from you, not me. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and uh, verse number 20. Three, First Corinthians seven twenty three. First Corinthians chapter number seven, verse twenty three. The divine text says, "You are bought with a price. Amen. Yeah. Be not ye the servants of men." You. Father, bless your word now. Yeah. Amen. You can be seated. First Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 20 says, You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Lord has paid the penalty for sin. He paid all of it. His death was a payment of a penalty. He bore and paid it for sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ took the place of the sinner. He took the place of the sinner's sacrifice. God, God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself. It's beyond my wildest understanding, as I said to you before and asked you the question, I want you to think about it, and I'm sure some of you have. What is that essence of sin where the Bible said he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin? What is that? What is that? Think about that. If the Holy Spirit really begins to give you an understanding of what's going on there, you may understand more about the heart of God and about the price that was paid. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ suffer physically, but he suffered spiritually. Yeah. The Bible said he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God saw down into the very heart of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and what he was dealing with. This is why it says in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He saw the terrors of what was coming his way, and it wasn't the cross. It wasn't the physical death. It was that spiritual descent that he had to take and where he went so we could be bought and paid for. Amen. The price that was paid for us is the, is the greatest price, the most supreme price that could be paid. Nothing could be greater than that. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for us. The Bible says in Romans 4.25, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The Bible says in the book of... Uh, Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Yeah. Notice the offering. Notice the giving. In the book of uh, Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins. He gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Yeah giving himself, paying a sacrifice, paying for something. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse 18 says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then finally in Romans chapter number 5 and verse 8, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. When he died for Amen. us, he died for all folks. Don't ever let anybody flim flam you into a limited atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. He tasted death for every man. He didn't die just for uh, the elect. The elect is a, is a scriptural doctrine, yes. But the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was for all mankind. Amen. Not Amen. just a select few. So, Christ's death was a penalty 
a penalty. He paid the penalty to pay for sin. So what sin? Well, that's, that's again the thing that you need to pray about. It's, you know, it's a good thing that the Bible has things that will make you think. You know, somebody said, well, it's missing the mark. What mark? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You think, you think that's the essence of sin? Missing the mark or coming up short? The Bible said sin originated in heaven. Did it or did it not? Satan, Lucifer, was the first sinner. The first one to sin. Where was he? He was in a place where he abode not in the truth. He was in heaven. And that started there. And he was cast out from heaven. So that proves that the environment does not make you a sinner. And this is what sociology teaches. Sociology teaches take the man out of his environment and naturally he'll do better. This is because they teach that man has a spark of divinity in him. You see the old liberal doctrine. You have no spark of divinity in you. Our propensity is to go down. All we like children, all we like sheep of don't astray. Turn every man to his own way. And the scripture says he hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's the natural inclination of man to veer away from God, not toward God. So no, your environment does not make you what you are. You, you make your environment because of what you are. The environment of this world and all the killing and all the raping and all the muggery and all everything that's going on on this earth is a product of man. Amen. The earth didn't make man the way he is. Man made the earth the way it is. So the essence of sin goes far, far deeper than missing the mark. There's something to that. And I don't have the answer for you tonight, but I do know this. I know it's a powerful thing. It's very powerful. Yes. So he was the penalty. He was the penalty, and he bore and paid for sinners. There's three New Testament words that describe redemption or the ransom price paid. Three of them. The Greeks had a number of words. We translate it in the English language, you know, using one word to translate a number of English word, uh, uh, Greek words. For example, love. Agapeo is the Greek word for God's love. Phileo is the word for kind of brotherly love. Eros is another word for love, like the love of a husband and a wife and so forth. These are Greek words that have specific, distinct meanings that the one English word love will not exhaust. You have to get it in context. You have to understand exactly what's going on. So it is with, with redemption. He bought back. He paid for. He owns us, right? We've been bought with a price. God owns us. We don't own ourselves. He's the sovereign of the world. And I'm going to tell you the truth about it tonight. I'm, I'm, so, I'm all right with that, brother. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad somebody worthwhile owns me. <laughs> because I was sold under sin, according to the Bible. Amen. Let's look at those three words tonight. Three Greek words. And, uh, and their application, and it's remarkable when you see how it works. One of them is agorazo, agora. You know what the agora was. It was the marketplace. It was where things were bought and sold. Exchanges took place. And the agora was always close to the place of debate. And as I've said to you before, debate is a good thing. Yeah. Anytime you get a political party or a group of people or a school or someone like that who shuts down debate, then what they're doing is they're saying, you think the way I tell you to think, or you're not going to think at all. That's totalitarianism. Amen. That's dictatorship. No, I say to you before, if you don't agree with a certain part of the scripture, you hold to something that's a little different, that's fine. But the Bible says you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within you. You should be able to defend your position. Normally when you, when you are given a PhD, you have to defend a thesis. You write a thesis, then you defend it. You stand before a board, and you're supposed to be able to handle that. Agora, agorazo. That means to go into the marketplace and purchase in situ, where it is. Go right in there and buy it. Now, the world says, come out of the world, and then God will save you. The devil says, clean your life up, and then the Lord will accept you. Once you've done your part, God will do his part. No, God does, does it all. It's all God's part, not ours. He even puts the faith in you to believe. <laughs> Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing with the word. Now look how the scripture uses that agarazzo. Over here in uh, Romans chapter number 7. 
Verse number 14, Romans 7, 14. This lays the foundation for you to get an idea of what we're talking about here. Romans chapter number uh, 4 and verse 7, rather. Romans 7 and verse number 14. Romans chapter number 7, verse 14. Romans 7, 14. Find this thing and open it up. Here we are. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold under sin. All right. Well, sold mean that means somebody owns me. That's like uh, Go uh, Gomer in the Old Testament. She had been sold. She was she she uh, she was she was owned by someone, and then she was brought to a place where she could be resold. This is what happens. You are a, he that committed sins, a slave of sin. And whether we realize it or not, once you are sold into sin, then sin is your master. He, com he that committed sin is a slave to sin. The word committed there literally means practices sin. Talk about it, and it's, it's your life. So Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 14 is talking about a slave sold under sin. So... When God comes to redeem you, that's where he finds you. He finds you on the selling block. He finds you a slave. That's important to understand. Char Charlotte Elliott said, just as I am without one plea. Exactly. Yes. Satan wants you to spend your whole life trying to please God and be accepted. We're already accepted in the beloved if we're born again. You see what I mean? God does not accept you because of your goodness or your righteousness or your ability or your sincerity. He accepts Christ. And if you will accept Christ, He's accepted you. Yes. Be ye reconciled to God. That He said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Now look over here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 20. Notice that I read it to you just a moment ago. 1 Corinthians 6.20 where it says we are bought with a price. All right? That bought is redeemed. Like a ratso. You're bought in the marketplace. Okay? That's important. That's what's used there. You are bought. Agorazzo. In the agora. That's where God bought you. He didn't buy you anywhere else. He bought you right there where you were. In 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Look at that one with me tonight. 2 Peter 2.1. Look at this one. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. You see that? They deny the Lord that bought them. The word bought there, agorazzo, bought them in the marketplace, in the agora, because they were sold under, under sin. Now I want you to notice, uh, Calvin has a hard time with this one. Why? Because here we have people who obviously were bought, see, the atonement, yet they don't know the Lord. They're denying the one that bought them. See what I mean? The idea of irresistible grace was hatched up somewhere in a chicken yard. <laughs> it didn't come from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Bought there. Second Peter chapter number 3. Chapter 2, verse 1. Look at Revelation chapter number 5 and verse 9. Revelation 5, 9. He tries to give, us a, to give us a little sense of how the Bible uses these terms. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed, agarazzo, us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Bought where you are. All right, that's agarazzo, agarazzo. Now the next word is ex agarazzo. Ex agarazzo. What does the word exodus mean? Come out. It means to come out. So when that ex is prefixed to it, it means to come out of the agora. To be redeemed out of. To be redeemed from. And look how the scripture uses it. Uh, in, first, uh, in Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 13. Galatians 3.13. I love the book of Galatians. Yes. I do. It's a, 
Galatians is a powerful book, folks. Christ hath exagorazo, hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He has brought us out away from the curse. See? And it doesn't stop with that. It doesn't stop with simply bringing you out away from the curse. But you put, He puts a mark on you and says, no longer for sale. Have you ever gone to buy, go out and buy something and, oh, I love that. And then when you look at the tag a little closer, it says, sold. You missed it. Too late, see. It's already been sold. Well, that's the way it is with redemption. You have been called out of this world and God's marked you. And Satan understands he can never curse you again because you belong to the Lord. You've been redeemed from it. you redeemed out of it. And there's a mark on you that says, no longer for sale. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad for that. Hallelujah. No longer for sale. Galatians 4, 5. Look at this one. Galatians 4, 5. The Scripture says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, to bring them out. Ex agorazo. Ex agorazo. The agora. To take out of the agora. To remove it from. In plainer words, you've been marked that you no longer are for sale. You're no longer a slave. You no longer belong to Satan. Although you are still in this world, you're not part of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen, folks. It is. It is in heaven, not here. That's why we're called pilgrims and strangers. So if I call you a pilgrim, that's not a bad term. <laughs> I don't mind being called a pilgrim. I'm just passing along. Abraham was a pilgrim. Abraham never lived in a house any day of his life. Did you know that? He spent his whole life living in tents. And he lived 175 years. 175 years Abraham lived. And he lived in tents. I'll tell you one thing, buddy. Well, anybody could pitch a tent any better than Abraham. You've been pitching one that long. You, know? you, can, you can put a tent up. Amen. So you've got to remember, this world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen. We have no continuing city here. Amen. This is not our home. It's not our home. How many times have you read in the obituaries in the newspaper where it says they went home at such and such a date? They went home. Went home to be with the Lord. Their home is there. All right. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. So we have been bought out of, and he has marked us, and we are not for sale anymore. Then the third Greek word, first one is agorazo, from the agora. Ex agorazo, to call out. And then the third one is lutro. And what does that word mean? It means to let loose. I mean, after all, you've been bought and paid for, right? He's not going to keep the shackles on you. He's not leading you around with a ring in your nose like a cow or something. He has made you free. That's what Lutro means. Look at Luke chapter number 24, verse 21. Luke 24, 21. Luke chapter number 24, verse 21. Now what? look at this now. We trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed. Lutro, redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. In other words, set us free from Roman oppression. See how it's, that's the context here. Set us free from Roman oppression. Shake off the, the shackles of the enemy, of the foreigner, the usurper, the empire. Who are they in Rome to come down and bring us into subjection? Yeah. This is not their land. We're not their people. That's what empires do, folks. That's the way empires operate. They go into the sovereign nation and take down and control. And so this is what happens here. He said, you have been, they thought it should have redeemed Israel. See? Set them free. Lutro. Look over here in Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14 
who gave himself for us, that he might lutro, redeem us from what? Set us free from it, iniquity. See this? Yeah. And purified himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. See that? You're no longer a slave to sin. That's what John's talking about in 1 John. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Well, then it turns right around and says, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. Which one is it? Well, what he's talking about there in 1 John 1 is the fact that you are not perfect, that in 1 John 3, he's saying you don't practice, live in sin. There's the difference. There's the difference. There's the difference. And this is what's going on here. If you've really been redeemed, part of your redemption means that you were carried, you were caught, you were taken from where you were, then you were marked to be owned by the Lord. He bought you and paid for you to bring you out of the Agora. And then He set you free, made you free. Amen. Hallelujah to God. You don't have to be a servant of sin anymore. And you don't have it in your ability to do that. None of us do. But the power of the Holy Ghost can. Yes. Amen. Amen. Prayer and Bible reading and fellowship. So important, folks. There's no substitute for it. Get on your knees and start talking to God. Read His Holy Word. And then commune with Him. Commune with Him. Commune with Him. Boy, I got an email yesterday from somebody up in Indiana now. That's wearing, or Ohio, Indiana. I forget which one it is. She's wearing me out. <laughs> I've gotten about three or four. You know who I'm talking about. Boy, she sent me an email yesterday or the day before. And she said, now listen to this. She said, here you're talking about talking to the Lord all day long. And you talk to the Lord about this. And you talk to the Lord about that. She says, listen, none of that matters. You know, you've got to be obedient. Why would you make somebody mad talking about talking to the Lord? You see what to have to deal with. She, it's amazing at, at, at what happens to folks, I'm telling you. And I don't hate this poor soul. We'll pray for her. I don't know who she is. But for some reason, I'll, I'll probably get something from tonight. <laughs> if, she, if, she, if she's watching, I might as well get ready. It'll come in. Edna gets it first, and then she sends it to me. <laughs> and I thought about writing back, uh, obedient to what? And then let her... Commit herself. What are you talking about? You see, there's an awful lot of people on this earth, folks, that believe that salvation is a matter of obedience, not faith. You're not saved by obedience, folks. You're saved by faith. That's the issue. That's what's going on. Faith. But anyway, she, uh, she sent me that thing. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter 1, 18. You have to... You have to when you get into the ministry, you just kind of have to learn how to get along with things. <laughs> you never know. I mean, boy, I was excoriated the other day. You wouldn't believe when I mentioned this thing about the Mandela effect. You would have thought that, oh, did you read that one too, Edna? Oh, man. I'm the sorriest thing on the face of the earth because I don't believe in the Mandela effect. And I don't, folks. This Bible right here is God's infallible Word. No mistakes. No errors. Preserved Word. Amen. You can forget the Mandela effect. All right. First Peter, uh, uh, First Peter chapter number 1. And uh, let me find my text here. Uh, first, first, 118. First Peter 118. Look at this. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, Lutro, Lutro, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ. What that do? That made you free. See what I mean? The blood of Christ. You notice the nuances of redemption now? You see, and I've only dealt with three of them, but the nuances, the, the, the difference of the shades of meaning, they're all connected. They all, they all uh, edify each other. But there's a difference going on here. Because, you know, if a man says he's born again and yet he's still living the same life he's always lived and he's still got the same, uh, you know, I mean, he's just bound. And folks, a man that is not born again is literally bound. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in the Old Testament, can the leopard change its spots? You see, he has no ability. The scripture says in Romans chapter number 7 that the flesh is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
There's nothing in the flesh to correspond with God. Now, there's two words used for flesh in the Bible. One of them is soma, which has to do with the body. Somosomatic, you see, psychosomatic, has to do with the body. Sarx is that other word that has a whole lot more meaning to it because it may refer to the flesh of the body, but it more than likely refers to the old nature, the old flesh nature. And that old flesh nature is not subject to the law of God. It can't respond to God because it's dead. God has to put His Holy Spirit in you so He can communicate with you. Amen. 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 So we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. That's what Peter told the man at the gate called beautiful. <laughs> he said, silver and gold have I none. Most Christians fit in that category, don't they? Yes. Silver and gold, have I none? <laughs> but what do we have tonight? Yes. I'll tell you what we've got tonight. We've got a man that can drive down from Michigan and sit on that second row right there. Amen. And the doctors give him up for dead. And he can come down here and be anointed with oil in the name of the yes. Lord. And he can go back up there and he can live. Yes. And, that what, that, and money, money can't buy that. That's not for sale. Yes. Can't buy it. Do you remember Simon over there in the book of Acts? Or he wanted to buy from the apostle that ability to lay hands on people. That's buying spiritual gifts and religious things. It's called simony to this day. Just look it up in the dictionary. Simony. It's buying spiritual things. It's not for sale. It's not for sale, folks. It's not for sale. The Lord said, freely you have received, freely give. Amen. Amen, folks. There's no, money's got nothing to do with it. You come in here and you say, well, I'm flat broke. No, 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 no. If you've got faith to cry out to God, you're rich indeed. Yeah. If you're willing to call upon His name. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's not for sale. It has nothing to do with money. <coughs> so, the uh, uh, silver and gold. So, in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18. Look at Romans 8, 23. And this give you a little. this will show you another perspective on the same word. Romans 8, 23. Look at this now. This, this is a beautiful thing. I mean, it, uh, it, we're talking about being free. Look at this. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. We've got the Holy Spirit tonight. That's proof positive. We're born again, and God's Word's going to come to pass. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the lutro. No, wait a minute. Waiting for the adoption to with the lutro. The redemption of our body. The apostle, in the New Testament, your body is always set like this once you're born again. It is like a prison that holds you in and that one day God's going to open it up and you're going to leave. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 He's going to open it up. And this is what he's talking about here in verse number 23. Yes. Waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Freedom from this one and to receive that one. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. If we ever really got that into our soul and really had, if we really meditated on that one, if we really did, where he, he said, it is far greater to be with Christ. He said, I have a desire to depart and be with him. Then we would view everything completely different. Absolutely. Completely different. It would, it's the idea that, you know, I'm here, but I'm real, I'm there. That's where I want to be and not here. And so the, the apostle talks about that for us here in uh, waiting for the redemption. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 30. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed... See this? Now notice this is a future thing. Somebody may come along and say, well, you see, the Bible says that you have to wait to be redeemed. See? How you could twist that? But that word is lutro. It has nothing to do with redemption and salvation. It has to do with the redemption of your body. Look at verse number 30. Whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. A new one. Trade in the old one for a new one. I'm ready to trade it in, but believe me, 72 years, I'm, I've got a lot of wear and tear on this old face. <laughs> I'm a, I need an upgrade. I need, a, I need an overhaul, brother. I need, a, I need, a, I need to be remodeled. <laughs> Amen. 
He's going to give me a glorified body one day. It'll never age. A land where you'll never grow old. Amen. Lutro, swap in the old. Think about it too. Look what he's getting and what he's giving you. <laughs> what did he get when he got you? But well, look what he's giving you. <laughs> I mean, I believe I got the better end of the bargain, don't you? I really did. I, I got the better end of the bargain. No question about it. So, the, uh, the idea is that he goes into the marketplace. There's a lot of them in there bidding for you. They're bidding for you. They want to buy you. You're, you're bought and sold, you see. You're a piece of merchandise. You're sold under sin. That means that sin is your master, has power and control over you. He walks right into the midst of them. And he buys you because what he pays for you is worth more than anything they have. They can't match it. They can't match it. And so he's bought you right there where you are. Then he puts his mark on you. Sold. <laughs> I own this one. And that is, your, that, is your, that, is your, that is your seal, your letter to bring you out. And then when he takes you out, he looks at you eyeball to eyeball. And he takes the chains and he breaks them and makes you free. And if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. He doesn't hand you a license to sin. He hands you the grace of God to give you the power to overcome it. Amen. And thank God for that. That's just three perspectives on redemption. I'm glad, thank God, that I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. Amen. Father, bless your holy word. Thank you for the folks who came tonight. Lord, they sit here tonight and they've listened to this. they prayed about it. They've come together in the house of God to have prayer meeting. Thank you for this, Father. And I thank you for those that are watching right now through the, through the Internet, this live streaming, wherever it's going. have no way to know, Father. We have no idea where this is going right now and who's watching it. But bless it as it goes out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks.